What we do here matters, because what we don't do matters even more. We need to continue to push, and we at ADAO are going to continue to push the Surgeon General of the United States. As you know, the United States continues to use asbestos, and that indeed is a barrier to others stopping its use. The most horrific part of this whole story is that it is preventable. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Labatol. I'm with a group called the Environmental Institute. Uh, we're in Marietta, Georgia, and I'm going to talk about some asbestos issues focused on OSHA and worker protection issues. And let me kind of start this up. Um, we hear a lot of folks that really don't work with asbestos control. Think of it this way. We've heard a lot today from the medical people, uh, from the thinkers that are in government that make decisions and do public health work. Guys like myself, Tony, and a number of other folks that are in this room, we're in the trenches every day we're dealing with the people in what we call the asbestos control industry. The people that actually work with people that deal with asbestos in buildings, we train them, uh, we do air sampling around them, uh, we work with the contractors that do the work. And in this uh, graphic that you see here, just to give you a quick view of, of various agencies, and I don't have the National Institute of Health, Dr. Miller and Dr. Lehman's group, uh, but we have EPA and then OSHA, uh, which is typically the places where we live in asbestos control, but we also have a group called NIOSH, which deals with respirator issues and methods. ATSDR and their research can impact our work in the Department of Transportation, which has to deal with waste issues. Then this is the blueprint of what we do every day in terms of asbestos control. I'm in the training business. What I do is I stand in front of people like Tony, who's an asbestos inspector. We train people to be inspectors. We train them to be project designers, to manage projects. We train people to be workers and supervisors. And uh, what you'll see on the left-hand side is where we live in EPA. And NESHAP, uh, a very uncommon thing is uh, for folks that don't work in the industry, who says we have to remove asbestos? This is actually the bus driver for that, the asbestos NESHAP regulation. And this is the regulation federally that says before demolition and renovation work, you must remove uh, various types of asbestos. And there's a longer conversation. We'll just leave it at that. But it's demolition, renovation, and waste issues and a variety of other activities. That's been on the books since 1973, and it's been updated up into the early 90s. And then here is the schools rule, and it's principally uh, dealing with the management of asbestos in schools. It was a very big deal for us. Between about 82 and the early 90s, it's in its management phase. This didn't require removal. But we did an awful lot of removal back then, okay? And I do thousands of people, and I've been in this business 29 years, 26 of it in the training side. And um, I will tell you that I've met many, many people who said, I thought we moved, removed all of this years ago. To me, the only thing I could think is because there was so much activity during the schools thing, there was so much press that went on at that time, everybody, well, they're taking care of it. Taking care of what? Okay, we're gonna get to that, okay? So you notice at the bottom a thing called worker protection rule. Uh, we got uh, Mr. Thayer here, and we've all tracked uh, the progress of those guys for years. Um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the actual statute, not the regulation, the law, does not cover federal, state, city, and county workers. Okay. So what happened is, is that a number of those unions got together and said, hey, we want some protection too. So state, city, county workers have OSHA protection, but the federal people may or may not. It's called executive orders by various government groups. Some of them are better about it than others. I'll leave it at that. And then on the OSHA side, uh, where we are gonna spend some time today, we have three major parts of that general industry, which is people that are working around asbestos, but not typically disturbing it as part of their work. Construction is where we do asbestos disturbing activities. And I have just a small box there for shipyard employment for people to do ships and shipyard type work. Um, and Mr. Fight is here, I believe. That's, I think, part of their mission years ago was dealing with shipyard folks. Uh, that's very, very similar to construction, so that's why I didn't expand that one out. Uh, but they're very similar between general industry and construction, but construction, if you go about two-thirds of the way down, uh, you'll see classes of work. Class one two, one, two, three, and four is actually how we categorize when we do asbestos disturbing work. While many have talked about asbestos, we've done this in buildings, just as a quick review. EPA did uh, estimates in the early 80s uh, in terms of what they thought was out there. 31,000 school systems, we called them local education agencies. Uh, myself and a bunch of peers rewrote an EPA document uh, as a volunteer effort called the Purple Book, a 1985 document not long ago. 
And uh, we kind of guesstimated maybe 20, 25% has been removed from the school since the late 70s. So again, that means most is still there. And then Sean also threw this number up, 733,000 public buildings. What I will add to that though, this is, think of your office buildings. That does not include power plants, paper mills, uh, coal-fired plants of any sort, uh, military bases, and these sorts of places, folks, have unmeasurable miles of asbestos in them, which means most material is there, which means most of your workers in the industrial sector are in this every day. Okay, now, are we supposed to inspect? Well, sorta. Actually, schools, this is pretty well laid out since the uh, 80s, actually. Very specific regulations to inspect, assess the condition, manage, communicate, and we use, again, accredited inspectors to do that work. Industry and construction. Uh, EPA that asbestos niche app that I told you about, demolition, renovation, waste issues. There we actually have a very straight up thing called a thorough inspection prior to demo and renovation work. That's actually one of the, also one of the biggest violations in EPA is not doing that before people do demolition and renovation work. OSHA, uh, property owners and employers have a very important legal term there. It's called due diligence. It's actually in the section K. And building owners are supposed to have a responsibility to determine what is present. And they say anything that is known or should be known to contain asbestos. It's actually quite specific and it gets blown off quite a bit. Uh, but they're to determine locations, communicate, train, and protect. And with OSHA, think of OSHA as not so much doing complete building surveys, where is everything in a building. It's more about making sure we sample before exposures. So it may be a limited area, maybe limited materials. Now, do we have to remove? We think we've talked about this a little bit. It's another concept people have. You know, I thought we had to remove all this. No, there's no requirement to remove merely because it's present. It occurs prior to disturbance, as we talked about, and that's a NESHAP regulation. Some states can be quite stringent with this, too. Uh, OSHA, again, does not require removal, but you know what OSHA is about? Worker protection, uh, exposure assessments, work practices, and a lot of other things. If you're going to disturb it, what you have to do to disturb it safely, okay? Also, uh, in the phone calls I've had with Linda and many, many others over the years in terms of homeowners, OSHA and EPA do not really regulate the safety of homeowners. They don't regulate that, they regulate commerce. So when we have something like somebody knocking down a building right next to another homeowner, it's actually exempt. Uh, home demolition is exempt and asbestos niche app. Uh, you could literally take a house down right next to somebody and not be in violation. This has been a big debate in, within my community for many years as to what's appropriate. In Georgia, where I'm from, houses are regulated. But that's a minority of states in terms of demolition. Okay. Now, the one thing that's tough about OSHA, folks, uh, asbestos is not a priority program for OSHA. We've heard from federal people on this many times, actually. What they're concerned with the things we call immediately dangerous to life and health type issues, electrical safety, fall protection, confined spaces, trenching, things of that nature, okay? But OSHA is obligated and will respond to tips and complaints. This seems to be one of the principal ways of doing things, but what they also are very good at is doing interagency investigations with EPA, Department of Justice, state and local programs and the like. Very, very common. Frankly, they're obligated to respond to OSHA to worker issues, and they tend to for the most part. Um, again, when we do OSHA enforcement, think about industry in general, big factories and things versus like abatement work where they're disturbing asbestos. OSHA does many job site surveys for safety. Again, electrical scaffolds, ladders, these sorts of things. But while they're doing that, those people may not even think to look at the asbestos issues. It's really not part of their training. They may stumble upon it and write, at write violations, but unless it's apparent, they may not. Whereas when they get to, um, and again, I will say most of the very largest of industrial concerns usually are very diligent on these issues. This medium to small companies can really be a problem. Um, then with abatement projects, when OSHA does finally get to an abatement project, ooh, this is where it can get willful and serious real fast because they're usually there because of a complaint. Very, very, very few uh, reasons. Now in Region 4 where I'm at, uh, EPA and OSHA broken into 10 regions in the country. Uh, I'm in Region 4 and you notice uh, willful violations. We have willful and serious. It's sort of like we used to kid around about venial and mortal sins. It's not quite that simple, but it's a very big matrix in how this is assessed. But uh, you notice asbestos is there. You're also number nine, number nine for lead issues, which is something we deal with in this business as well. Okay, so the things I'm gonna look at very quickly, I'm just gonna jump here, is exposure assessments, uh, taking air samples on people, trying to figure out what their exposures are, communication, telling people what's asbestos and what's not, uh, employers not providing training as requirement, and then worker protection, one of my pet peeves, respirators, protective clothing, decon, and the like. 
So just a couple of quick things here, and I'm gonna show you a number of these. The top one, I have the underlying uh, company was uh, scheme to remove, dispose of asbestos from multiple condominiums in Florida. That means not trained workers, not protected workers, no waste issues, no OSHA, no EPA. Next one, three Ohioans. They stripped asbestos from the pipes using hand and power tools. Asbestos was allowed to fall on the floor. Notice that in the line in the middle is intent in selling the pipes of scrap metal. It's one of the last slides I'm gonna have today. Metals robbing in buildings right now is one of the biggest violations, especially for what we call the EPA circle people, the Superfund people. They're dealing with this in a real big way right now because um, nobody's there to pay for it except us as CERCLA. Okay, the last one here, uh, city, Elk City employee inmate residents uh, uh, through the Elk City Worker Center to various city projects. This is not uncommon, it's almost draconian really. They send uh, prisoners out to do abatement work that may or may not be trained. Happens in Georgia. Okay, uh, the graphic doesn't look great here, but I want you to understand what we teach in these classes. Uh, Andy Obert is here that's written a lot of this stuff. A lot of other people contributed to things uh, that are in our EPA guidance materials, also ASTM standards, where we have a building owner. They hire a project professional, someone that knows what they're doing. We have project monitoring people that monitors the work of an abatement contractor. So when we do removal, this is supposed to be done on a managed basis. I'm not gonna say that it always is. As a matter of fact, it's probably most of the time not like this unless you have state regulations that push it, okay? And there are some states that do. Uh, I wanna point out too, people have been talking about, uh, we were talking about phase contrast, PCM, and air sampling. This is what this looks like when people wear air sampling pumps during exposure assessments. Air is drawn into this cassette. This is a pump that actually pulls the air through the tubing, through the cassette here, and that is what get analyzed then. Okay, and there's various ways in which that can be performed, okay? And basically, inadequate exposure assessments lead workers to not either being exposed or inadequate protection being provided. This is one of the top violations. Actually, most of the time when workers complain, one of the very first things that a, an OSHA person will say to the employer is, we'd like to see your, assess well, your exposure assessment data. And you know what the usual answer is? My what? They don't even know what it is. Okay, here's another uh, Department of Labor. You guys can find this on the Department of Justice webpage, also at the OSHA webpages for these things. You see 2011, $1.2 million. Five unprotected, untrained workers allegedly were required to conduct asbestos removal. Uh, and then it goes on, you know, they didn't tell them, they didn't train them. And then what I have in yellow there, there was no uh, monitoring uh, to know what the air levels are. Frankly, once you're under permissible exposure limits, they would be fine with it, but as much as we might not like that, but that's the way it works, but there was no proof that they were below that, so this would, it would be very, very willful. Actually, in this one, I have a kitchen sink bouncing in, if you could find this one here, actually, about everything that could possibly be wrong on an OSHA violation was there. You don't normally see 1.2 million, so this was really bad. Another one I want to point out is worker protection, one of, my, one of my real pet peeves. You see that respirator on the right that looks like a big fancy thing here? It is a big fancy thing. We call it a powered air purifying respirator. It's a full face respirator like you see the fellow in the middle. It has a pump, uh, a motor actually that drives air through a, a cartridge and you breathe almost normally inside this. It's positive pressure, which means if there's any leakage, uh, air is more likely to come out. Okay, see this in yellow here, class one work. That's traditional removal of like fireproofing, pipe insulation, the big friable kinds of removal projects, the big ugly ones, you know, uh, that we still do. Uh, be honest with you folks, it says right here, class one work, you're supposed to start in one of these powered air purifying respirators. You can go to lesser protection if you have air samples to prove that they're adequate, okay? I'm gonna tell you folks, most asbestos abatement workers have never seen a PAPR. They're on the lowest, typically the lowest level protection, which is called a half-faced respirator. Nobody's looking for this stuff, folks. Unless somebody is a project designer or a state agency, it doesn't get found out. That's me with a kind of what we call the cheap Chinese suit. Uh, basically, a lot of these protective clothings have come out of uh, these light duty suits, really. It's not to be derogatory to the Chinese country, but um, it's, what it is is they're made in China. They're very, very thin in difference to things like Tyvek and Clean Guard, which are more traditional industrial hygiene garments that we use. These are bought because of one particular reason. They're cheap. They're a dollar a piece, and you can see right through them. They rip like crazy. Also for class one, you are not supposed to wear street clothes underneath them. How are you gonna ask a bunch of fellas, especially those, that have, especially those that have cultural biases from being seen naked by other men, 
that they're supposed to take their street clothes off under this. Well, when we were wearing Tyvek, which was opaque, those would rip too, and that was always a challenge. Uh, but frankly, you're supposed to give them disposable undergarments or swimsuits or something. There's a number of ways to accomplish it. But folks, I'm going to tell you, I want you to think about take home here. This is part of the problem right here. They're wearing clothes every day that they take home every day. A young man named Jack Snyder will be doing a thing at the EIA. Well, he actually did dust samples on people doing physical bodies, doing floor tile work. And the numbers that these people are coming out with, with wearing suits like this and minimum respiratory protection, their body and clothing is going home covered with thousands of structures per square centimeter. Okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to get him to publish this. It's just that he's kind of nervous about publishing it. Okay, here's another one again: uh, Buffalo, New York, ripped and torn protective suits, not wearing respiratory protection, which which it kills me. It's like they gave them the protective garments, but not respirators. I guess it just makes them feel better if they wore a fancy suit. Another one for class one work, uh, fireproofing, pipe insulation and like. We use showers, folks. It's a full decon system. Uh, just like a hazardous waste worker and things of this nature, there are many things in industrial hygiene where we use showers as decontamination. Um, but in this case, it is required. It's actually, you have to compel the workers to use them. Okay, so what happens is, oh, thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, what happens is they never take a shower, guys, and it's a problem. And I'll leave this with you. It's just another one here, no showers and the like. And in the metals, I just want to show you this. Look at this last one. Somebody robbed a bunch of metals, left pipe insulation, and the kids found it in the hallway, took it out in the street, and used it as chalk to draw. Pipe insulation with asbestos. Okay, guys, thanks. I'll end it there. Thank you.